Hello, everyone. Welcome to Indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. And I know I say this a lot. Oh, my favorite person, my favorite person, my favorite person. They are, okay? Benny Carollo, uh, breakdown, contributor, host of Bleep, Blomp, Ben. I always have to read it, Benny, okay? Because it'll trip me up every time. Um, we are just so honored, guns out today too, to have you as our guest co-host because the commentary is always on point. And so I think we should launch right into it because we're going to need you for this one. Okay. He may need you too, uh, but let's, let's just go there because someone has stepped in it and big time Hakeem Jeffries facing backlash for a resurfaced 1992 op-ed. What could be so terrible? What could he have said that is haunting him today? Well, I'll tell you, okay? The House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, under fire for an editorial he wrote when he was a college student attending Binghamton University. In the editorial, Jeffries defended his uncle, Black Studies professor, Leonard Jeffries, as well as Nation of Islam leader, Louis Farrakhan, in the piece. Leonard Jeffries was criticized for comments he made in the 1990s about the slave trade and the involvement of, quote, rich Jews. He also said a, quote, conspiracy planned and plotted and programmed out of Hollywood by Jewish movie executives was to blame for disparaging black people in films. Farrakhan in the past called Judaism, quote, dirty religion. And a black star with the details there. After his uncle lost his teaching position, Jeffries wrote, quote, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Minister Louis Farrakhan have come under intense fire, wrote Jeffries. Where do you think their interests lie? Dr. Jeffries has challenged the existing white supremacist educational system and longstanding distortion of history. His reward has been a media lynching, complete with character assassinations and inflammatory, erroneous, accusations. Hakeem Jeffries also compared Black conservatives to, quote, House Negroes. The House Negroes didn't labor in the field. They were domestic servants. The House Negro was dressed up, led to believe that he or she was better than those in the field. Most importantly, the House Negro sought to emulate the white master. He wrote, the House Negro of the slavery era and the Black conservative of today are both opportunists interested in securing some measure of happiness for themselves within the existing social order. Mm. Jeffrey's previous response to the controversy told the Wall Street Journal back in 2013 that he had a, quote, vague recollection of the controversy surrounding his uncle and Farrakhan, but that he was away at college at the time and frequently referred back to statements given to the Wall Street Journal when asked about the controversy, quoting, and so when a lot of the controversy took place and my brother and I were away at school, he said, there was no internet during that era. And I can't even recall a daily newspaper in the area, but it wasn't covering the things that the New York Post and Daily News were at the time. CNN reports that Jeffries knew more about the controversy than he let on and even invited his uncle to speak at his school while he was on the board of the university's Black Student Union. Leonard Jeffries accepted the invitation and reiterated his comments about Jewish moguls in Hollywood being, quote, anti-Black to a crowd of 800 people. He also defended himself for the backlash he received from the Jewish community by comparing them to Nazis. Spokesperson for Jeffries Christiana Stevenson telling the outlet that the House Minority Leader does not agree with his uncle's views. Okay, the first thing, Benny, that I thought of in reading this, besides that, whoa, let's unpack this, is that candidate, and I don't know if it's fair. I don't know if this is a fair comparison. But do you remember that fiery preacher that then candidate Barack Obama gave speech about and had to disavow, had to disavow. And that last part of the quote from the spokesperson that says, the House Minority Leader does not agree with his uncle's views. That's what 
triggered it for me. But I want your take first. Yeah, um, this is one of those things where like, so there's so many layers to this, but at the root of this is this white supremacist propaganda that's put across and this anti-Semitic uh, propaganda that's put across um, all throughout the United States and really the Western world. Uh, and the reason why anti-Semitism has been so deeply rooted within like the United States and Western Europe for a very, very long period of time is because all of the stereotypes, all of the like conspiracy theories, all of these things are really crafted in such a way that make Jewish people, unfortunately, an easy scapegoat for anybody who is wealthy and powerful. So when you have wealthy capitalists, for example, people like Jeff Bezos that are underpaying workers, when you have these systemic problems in society, right, which we like the problems are real, right? People are broke right now. People are struggling to survive. People don't have access to health care. There are a lot of problems that our society is dealing with, except for instead of actually looking at the people who actually have power, who are actually responsible for these problems, they just scapegoat and say that it's Jewish people. They just, because there are all of these ridiculous stereotypes, there's all these ridiculous stereotypes and conspiracy theories about Jewish people. And at the end of the day, it's just this anti-Semitic narrative that has literally been used like since like medieval times where you'd have kings that would say, oh, well, it's actually not my fault. It's, it's, it couldn't be my fault. No, it's, it's, it's Jewish folks that are, that are doing this. And really, that's one of the reasons why anti-Semitism has been around for so long and why, you know, as a society, we've had a difficult time really rooting it out. Because unfortunately, there are a lot of like powerful people that see the benefit of keeping anti-Semitic tropes around. Right. And so it is true that Hollywood, for example, has been very racist in its portrayal of black Americans. That is definitely true. But that's not something that's like orchestrated by Jewish people. That is something that's orchestrated by the racial biases of the people that produce movies. Right. The racial biases of the people that are willing to put money to make movies happen. Right. Like it's the, the racial biases that exist within like, um, you know, these big media companies and stuff like that. But it's not. Jewish people doing that, right? And it's it's just really, really like on its face, fundamentally absurd. But this is just one of those ways where like fundamentally you have the extreme right pushing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories because they don't want to address the real problems. They don't want to address the actual root of the problem. And instead of addressing who the people are that are actually responsible, right? Which yeah. is just wealthy capitalists, they want to scapegoat. If I hear the name George Soros one more time, it's just like, you're just George Soros in everything, right? Okay, I actually would like to meet him. So I can say, how do you handle all this, right? Okay, but it's this thing where you wanna divide groups and keep people apart so you can keep your little game going. That's what it really is about. What and how do you think the rest of us should react when you have a figure like Hakeem Jeffries, who has an enormous amount of support and and promise? Does he still have it? Can he still garner that support? I don't know. But when you like or love or support or believe in someone, it's difficult to call them out. What needs to be the response here? Because again, I don't know how old you are, Benny. I'm not that. I'm not that old, but I've seen some years. College we're talking about. But it seems that some of the views and the defense of them, as the CNN reporting was, that had legs beyond the college years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really like it's really unfortunate because like, well, I guess I'll put it this way. When you're talking about representatives of Congress, like we should really have incredibly high standards, right? Like the truth of the matter is there are literally millions of people in the United States that have never believed anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And like, I think it's fine to set that as a bar, even if it was a very long time ago. Cause like fundamentally, if you're susceptible to that type of thinking, right? Even if on some level you've grown past it, right? There are people who are potentially more qualified. There are people who are potentially more capable who like didn't engage in those things and might not have some sort of instinct to defend who they were in the past. Right. And, you know, that's one of those things where I, I think it is kind of like really important. Um, but then like a layer beyond that, I guess, is just the the real question of like. If those are the types of things that you grew up thinking in college, right. Um, 
that's going to shape your views. You've probably learned a lot of things within that context, right? And even if you've unlearned some of it, you might still carry that some some of that around with you. And so I guess it kind of gets really complicated in terms of like, you know, what does redemption look like? What does growth look like? I personally don't know enough about Hakeem Jeffries personally to speak as to whether or not like he's grown beyond this. Um, but like ultimately at the end of the day, if it's something that is like continuing and elements of it are continuing, um, I think just generally we should have a higher standard for people who are elected in the positions of power, right? Especially somebody like Hakeem Jeffries, who is really high w- within the Democratic Party. Yeah, he is. And, and thought to be the next Speaker of the House if the Dems get it back. But I'll, I'll button it with this. You know, as we watched Hakeem Jeffries uh, rap and, and quote Biggie and Tupac uh, on the floor, um, he's so gifted and he's just incredible. And I've always thought of him to be so authentic. And I need to hear what is real. Who are you? What do you believe? Just don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. Because once you do that, what am I going to do with you? We'll move on. Speaking of lying, <laughs> okay. It's like in the DNA of this organization, apparently. The mighty Fox News Corp, you just, everything is just, what is it? The emperor has no clothes? Is that how you say it? Fox News sanction for withholding evidence in this monster case. Would they do that? Yes. Delaware Superior Court Judge Eric Davis on Wednesday sanctioned Fox and its parent company, Fox Corp, for withholding evidence in the Dominion defamation suit and said he is considering further investigation and censure. If I was a lawyer, I'm not, I'd be really afraid if I was representing Fox, I'd be really afraid. What does it say about my license? What happens next? Well, according to a person present in the courtroom, according to Fox News producer, rather, Abby Grossberg made during 2020, which were not handed over to Dominion's lawyers during discovery, Grossberg, Former producer for Fox host Maria Bartiromo, Tucker Carlson, too, has sued Fox and said her deposition was coerced. Hmm. In an amended filing Tuesday, she said she had recorded conversations with Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and others. The sanction gives Dominion a chance to conduct another deposition at Fox's expense. Well, this will go about three days. If Fox is paying, you might as well go three days. The surprise evidence and sanction comes days before the trial is scheduled to begin in the 1.6 billion defamation case Dominion Voting Systems filed against Fox News and Fox Corp. Davis also said Wednesday he was considering appointing a special master to investigate the Fox legal team's actions. Isn't that when the special master starts getting appointed, they find out everything, okay? It's what they do. They, they're these people who just love to comb through everything and say, no, nah, you had this email back on this day. You did this on that day. I remember. It's all up here, too. I don't even believe they're looking at anything. OK, it's all up here when they're a special master. They love it. Whew, this is bad. On Tuesday, Judge Davis expressed frustration at Fox News for not being straightforward about Rupert Murdoch's role as a leader at Fox News. Quoting, this is a problem, Davis said, according to a court transcript. I need to feel comfortable when you represent something to me that is the truth. But it wasn't. So there's so much here, Benny. This huge domineering middle finger to the truth organization, right? Because that's really what they're doing to all of us, indoctrinating people every day and then pretending it's journalism, pretending it's news. We had enough bias in the other news, right? But Fox? takes it to a whole new level. But this is about holding some of the most powerful people accountable. And this judge is somewhat of a hero. I don't know his full background to me, Benny, but here's what I like about it. He's calling him out on everything, public, loud, releasing things, you know, after it's in court, he's releasing the transcripts and releasing the audio. And speaking of an investigation now that could really get people in trouble and threaten their licenses, What do you think about this judge's actions and the great mighty Fox finally being called out? 
Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think a lot of transparency is really important, especially with something as high profile as this with like Fox News, because Fox News is continuously to this very day still broadcasting and putting out information. Right. And I would say they're putting out a lot of like hateful information and misinformation. Um, And so it is important that people have more awareness about like sort of Fox News's willingness to lie in general. And then, of course, there's the layer on top of this, which is to say that like if Fox News's legal team is getting caught lying, hiding information, right, um, coercing information on like depositions and stuff like that, well, then that really begs the question, right? If you are a lawyer, if you are a capable lawyer and you are working for a large news network like Fox News, why would you feel the need to hide information, right? Why would you feel the need, um, you know, to, to hide information like that? Because if they're doing that, then that seems to be emblematic of their sort of like understanding that maybe Fox News was doing the wrong thing, that maybe perhaps, uh, that maybe perhaps they were doing the wrong thing knowingly, right? And so I think it is really important to see how these things develop. And it is good that they're taking deliberate action to say like, hey, it seems like you're hiding information and like prying even further, um, which will like undermine the case because that is like, a, you know, if you're a lawyer, like not only is it like, against the law to just be like hiding information when you're, you know, a judge is telling you to to relinquish information. Um, but that is like a pretty extreme risk to take because if you get caught, uh, like it seems like they did, um, then all of a sudden you're on a whole nother layer of trouble. Um, and so like to take that risk, it seems like there might've been a calculation going on uh, internally that things were pretty bad to start off with. Couldn't agree more. I mean, and these are real big time lawyers who are getting paid a lot of money. And usually when you've worked to get to that position, you're not willing to lie for your clients and jeopardize your whole life. I mean, Fox doesn't have, you know, the guy with the hair dye running down his face, the ex-mayor representing them. They just put him on the air. Okay. They have big time lawyers who had to have thought that this is everything. Come on, guys. Come on. But we'll see how it plays out. But right now, Judge Davis, more. Tell us more. Um, What could be worse than a liar? I don't know. Someone who is across the pond and believes that member of the Tory party says white men should own slaves. At least, I guess he's saying the quiet part out loud. It's gross, but... Andrew Edwards, a conservative politician in the UK, is being investigated after an audio recording said to be him saying all white men should have a black man as a slave was unearthed. Let's play it for you. Nothing wrong with the skin color at all. I think all white men should have a black man as a slave or a black woman as a slave, you know? It's it's nothing wrong with skin color. It's just a lower class than... Okay, he's got a really important title. I'll try to get it right. Okay, there he was saying all white people should have a black person as a slave. Edwards is a councillor at Pembrokeshire County Council in Wales. Again, sounds very important. Has left the local Tory party while the probe takes place. Mr. Edwards has referred himself to the public services ombudsman. He said, I am aware of such serious allegations being made against me. It is now in the hands of legal experts and the ombudsman. It would be unfair on the process for me to comment. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't, Edwards. It's either. Wouldn't the first thing you say is, Benny, I didn't. Hey, that's not me. This song manipulated my voice, but that is not me. And that is not what I believe. Not I'm not going to comment it. The ombudsman is. What say you? Yeah, I mean, seriously, like if you said it, you said it. If you didn't say it, you didn't say it. And obviously, if you did say it and you're uncomfortable and you're like, oh, no, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe you should have thought of that before you said it. Or maybe you should not have just thought that. I don't know. Call me the thought police or whatever. But I feel like normal people aren't thinking things like that. Um, And so I guess in some sense, it's good that this person is getting caught and hopefully people in the UK get an understanding of what types of people are succeeding within the Tory party. I don't know, that might be a pretty significant indicator of what the political values are. Um, Although the unfortunate reality is 
look, there are a lot of people both in the UK and the United States, really the Western world broadly, there are a lot of white folks who are at their core white supremacists. They unironically believe things like this. Um, a lot of them don't say it, um, but like that is the unfortunate reality that we live in a deeply racist society where racism is so normalized um, and it is seen as so regular that like these people quite literally feel comfortable saying this in any context itself, I think, is a condemnation of the political reality that exists within the UK and also within the United States, because we do share a very, very significant amount of culture uh, with the UK. Um, and so unfortunately, where you see a lot of United States pushing things like extreme racism, transphobia and bigotry like that, you also see that happening in the UK, where they push a lot of racism, uh, transphobia, etc. And uh, it is it is shocking, but not surprising. Yeah, shocking, but not surprising. I think that's that's well said, indeed. Well, there's more. A spokesperson for Penn Brokeshire Council said, quote, we are aware of an allegation being made and have referred the matter to the ombudsman. It would be inappropriate to comment further. Okay. The council's Tory group leader, Di Clement, said, these are extremely serious allegations. It has been mutually agreed that Claire Edwards, Councillor Edwards, I guess, We'll leave the group while the matter is under investigation. The Public Services Ombudsman confirmed it had received Mr. Edwards' self-referral. I got a problem with that too, Benny. Well, how in the hell can he self-refer? Wouldn't you and I be leaping over desks to refer him first, okay? Wouldn't we be like, I got him, and we'd, we'd be fighting over who's going to refer this guy. He self-referred himself? This is ridiculous, no? Yeah, I mean, and even like, I don't know, like, I guess there are formalities that need to be done, but like, I'm confused. What's the investigation for? It seems like there's like an audio clip. If, if that, is that his voice or is that oh, not his yeah. voice? Like, I don't know. Like, wh what are we investigating at this point? <laughs> yeah, it's come on. You know, remember that show Cheaters, Joey Greco? Okay. Even, even the guys and gals who got caught on that. Okay. When Joey played the recording and said, I want to show you something, remember that show? The show is horrible. I mean, you're just putting their worst moments. You got to stop, Joey, because people can get hurt. But they would say, all right, I'm out of here. They would either run or confront the situation. Well, sometimes they would run. They wouldn't just say, you know, refer to the spokesperson. Either Joey would ask, is this you? Because we caught you here and then you were with your lover over there and then you did this. What do you, and then he'd say, talk to her, them, him, whoever, talk, explain yourself. And that's what we need to hear here. But apparently that's not happening. At any rate, uh, Cheaters is not a good show. You should not, it's just too salacious. This is indisputable. Where the truth is important, the truth matters. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. We're right back. We've been uh, concentrating on some foreign affairs today on Indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed, in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie, Benny Carollo. Breakdown contributor, Bleep Blomp Ben on Twitch is with us today. And so I think it's fitting, Benny, that we should um, not necessarily go American with, I wish a Karen would. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? I, I'm going to give you the floor on this one, Benny, but I want to do it with first just a question. And if you could just real quick, give me the answer to this. 
more obnoxious, Karen with an Australian accent or an American Karen, which is is more obnoxious? I mean, I guess the Australian accent is yeah. unique, right? It's different than what we're used to here. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. If you're on vacation like that, what's going to compel you to be sh- like shouting at people? Like, I don't know. I've never felt the need to like shout at people randomly like that when I've been at like a pool on a vacation, like relaxing. Like usually you just want to you just want to sit back and relax. But instead of doing that, apparently she just decided to make a scene. And um, I don't know. That just doesn't seem like normal like vacation behavior. And I couldn't even really make out exactly what she was saying. Um uh, I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying, but she definitely seemed like very, very riled up to say the least. Yeah. And you know what? You don't need to know. We don't really need to know. But we know. Right. Don't we know? OK. Obnoxious. And you're absolutely right about this. If you're on vacation and you can't relax or maybe this is how maybe that is fun. I don't know. Maybe that is fun for her. But if you're on vacation and you're irate at the top of your lungs and this is how you behave. You might want to pick another spot. The pool looked inviting. The drinks were flowing perhaps too much. Why do this? And what do you do except, I don't know, did you ever play that? Just dunker, okay? You gotta just dunker or give a timeout, okay? You're in timeout, dunker. What do you do if you're lounging, Benny, and you hear this just nonstop? What do you do? Yeah, I mean, being in situations like that are always, like, complicated and difficult, right? Because, like, obviously the people in the video were laughing, right? And if you laugh, like, you could maybe make them realize that their whole scene that they're trying to make isn't working and or getting them what they want, and so maybe they'll back off. But then maybe you laughing will get them, like, angry, and then who knows how things will escalate from there. You could just be quiet and ignore it, but sometimes ignoring it gets people more upset. So all of these things, I guess, are just really difficult for me personally. <laughs> If I saw that, I probably wouldn't engage. I might laugh a little bit, um, but if it went on for longer than five or 10 minutes, I'd probably go get a snack and find my way back to the pool in a little bit. (laughs) And then, then, you know what, we'd get mad later because the snack would be, you know, out of the mini bar. So now we've got to pay through the wazoo for that because she, you know, won't shut up, okay? But just remember, laughing can also encourage. I remember my daughter was in diapers and she'd make these little, well, flatulence, you know what babies do. And if we laugh, she laughed louder and louder and she kept doing it. I think they're going to do it anyway. We'll move on. A teacher is fired after writing racial slur on a whiteboard. There are plenty of good teachers out there. This is not one of them, apparently. Las Vegas substitute teacher has been immediately fired after a photo posted online showed him writing the N-word on a Sylvester Junior High School whiteboard. What in the world would possess? Okay. Students from Charles Sylvester Junior High alerted their principal, Yvette Tippetts, and other administrators about one of her staffers being at the center of the racially volatile tweet. The unidentified male teacher was seen speaking to students with the word on the whiteboard, According to the Las Vegas Review Journal, picture was posted on the No Racism in Schools hashtag 1865 page for all to see. Schools principal Yvette Tippett released a statement to parents informing them that the school had launched an investigation into an issue that, quote, involved communication that contained racial implications. You think, Miss Tippett? <laughs> you think? Administration will continue to communicate with you about these situations because it will take the entire Sylvester Junior High School community to condemn these actions collectively, the principal promised. I assure you that appropriate action will be taken against those responsible based on the outcome of the investigation. Additionally, I would like you to know that this will not be tolerated at our school or within the school district. We will not tolerate behaviors that contradict an inclusive community and impact the needs of our students. Mm. Liz Guzman, one of the Clark County School Board trustees tweeted this, the district has removed this individual. They will no longer be able to substitute at any school in the Clark County School District 
I want to commend the students that turned in this horrific act. It allowed the district to move swiftly. Parents applauded the district for taking this incident seriously. One parent tweeted this. As a parent of a Sylvester Street kiddo, I'm glad this was taken seriously and there were immediate consequences for this individual who has no place in a classroom with our kids. Proud of the kiddos who spoke up. Well, this is lovely, Benny. I think, it, unless you heard something other wise, I find this response lovely. And I there's really not much there that I can, and you know, I like to like pick apart things. I think they handled this just right. I still want to know why Homeboy was writing the N word on the whiteboard. What was that about? Yeah, most definitely. And every time I see something like this, my first thought is like, there's no way this is the first person this guy's done this, right? Like, because like, of course it's not going to be the first time, right? I mean, maybe, maybe it could possibly be the first time that substitute's done it. But, right, like, you don't get to the point where you're doing things like that without sort of escalating and feeling the waters and, and getting to that point, right? And we live in a deeply racist society, right? And unfortunately, a lot of a lot of people that have worked in schools across the United States of America have been very comfortable doing a lot of really, really horrible stuff. I mean, I remember just a couple years ago, there was uh, like a story about a school where like a teacher had done like a slave auction in the school um like as like some sort of like historical teaching moment which obviously wasn't really a teaching moment mm -hmm. um i guess except for the teachers that were dealing with that situation when they realized that uh that there wasn't really educational value in that and people uh responded publicly um but the administration here was clearly just doing the right thing in terms of like responding immediately firing the teacher making sure that they're not going to be you know, working with a school district anymore. And that sends a positive signal because now if there's any other like potentially racist teacher that might want to substitute there, they know that they won't be able to get away with stuff. And so that's very good. Um, but I guess the unfortunate reality is, is there's a lot of like sort of really awful stuff that happens in schools yeah. across the United States because unfortunately racism is just very normalized in our society and people think that they can get away with a lot. You know, racism, bigotry, you name it, you name the other group that is targeted to this. And I, I agree with you. There's just one thing that that's missing. In, and I don't know if the school's helping. We all remember that one moment as as a child that we never really got over that changed, you know, altered our view, altered perhaps even our happiness. And so when you have people like this, um, perhaps not vetted enough, who end up in the classroom with impressionable young minds and kids who deserve better, okay, all kids deserve better. How do you undo that? Because I don't think you can, Benny. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, like, the best thing you can do is what the school like did. And uh, hopefully there was a follow up directly with the students. Right. Because the most important thing after the fact, after there's a situation like this that happens with with kids, you know, somebody does or says something like racist or, you know, like bigoted in some way um, is to quickly get rid of the teacher and then respond by going to the students and saying, hey, we're, we have your backs. You're mm -hmm. safe here. This is fine. And we're going to respond appropriately to make sure this doesn't happen again. So at very least, they can have faith that the institutions are going to be there to, like, protect them from this happening again. Exactly right. I think you're exactly right, Benny. Much more indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie, who has the day off. We're right back. Oh, we're just hanging out, discussing uh, some of the top stories, most interesting stories of the day. Benny Carollo. Breakdown contributor and the host of Bleep Blomp Ben. I can't help it. I just have to say it every single time on Twitch. Um, love you, love you, love you. Let's get some viewer comments. YouTube member Laurel Dragon, gifted five, indisputable. Um, we appreciate you. Uh, I wish Karen would stop flapping her gums is the comment there. Uh, okay. Does anyone else see the irony about the teacher writing the N-word? On the whiteboard, just saying. Thank you, C. Michael Henson. Just saying. About the teacher fired for writing the racial slur on the whiteboard. You don't like my music? 
that wasn't even acceptable in the 1970s. Okay, about the Aussie Karen having a little too much fun on her holiday. Mosquito bite. On the plus side, you can't understand half of it. Okay, so this was a good thing, Benny, that, you know, we just heard little little bits. We know how Karens are. Okay, we know they were spewing hate and garbage and insults and whatever. I think you're exactly right. One more TOIT member. Well, let's see. Let me find like one more really insightful comment. Okay, Bama Raider 12 says American is way worse. So did we pick the Aussie accent on the Karen? Or did we say that made this Karen slightly more interesting? I can't remember, Benny, do you? I think I lean on the interesting side, just to, you know, shake things up a little bit. (laughs) In Texas, a black man gets 70 years for spitting on cops. Is this justice? Tell you more. Texas man, Larry Pearson is his name reportedly sentenced to 70 years in prison for spitting at Lubbock police officers during an arrest last May. There's Mr. Pearson. Cops picked him up on domestic violence charges after he allegedly hit a woman several times in the face, leaving her with, quote, multiple visible injuries. That's according to everythinglubbock.com. Pearson allegedly got angry when officers didn't arrest the victim and started kicking the door of the police cruiser. When two cops opened the door to demand he stop, Pearson spat at them. He kept doing so even after he got to the Lubbock County Detention Center. Again, according to the website. During the trial's closing arguments, Prosecutor Jessica Gorman asked the jury to, quote, send a message to both the suspect and society with its sentencing. Pearson had prior convictions for aggravated robbery and family violence. Gorman referenced that. As a result, he faced a minimum sentence of 25 years. This is what the prosecutor's arguing. Jurors indeed later found him guilty of two counts of harassment of a public servant. Okay, so let's put this in perspective. Remember what I said, two counts of harassment of a public servant. Jim Shaw, Pearson's defense attorney, told jurors that the sentencing was for a simple misdemeanor that got out of control. Various outlets have picked up on the story. Fox News, TMZ, Chicago Defender. Let's show you the headlines. It depends on who you're aligned with, what your headline looks like. Okay, and there you see it. Man gets 70 years for spitting at cops. But Fox says, Texas man who spit at police sees life of crime crumble. Slapped with 70 years in prison to send a message. Now, who wrote that Fox headline? You know that's not. You know that's not a good headline. It's so convoluted. There's too much in there. It's a compound. That's not how headlines are. That's not how they work best. But uh, this this case has garnered much attention. Rapper Meek Mill is weighing in on it, commenting on the story publicly. There's Meek's tweet. Now this action level. Ain't no way they can give us that much time for a misdemeanor like spitting. I don't care what they're going to try to say his record is no regard for black life in that courtroom. I guess, like I said, Benny, spitting is gross, okay? It's disgusting. I've only had it happen one time. I was babysitting some kids. We were at the playground, a group of older kids who just like worked no good. Well, they spat on my new Jordache jeans. Am I dating myself? They, they made a comeback, didn't they? And I was furious. And I took care of it. And I'm going to leave it at that because I don't know what the statute of limitations is. But 70 years for a misdemeanor and a prosecutor who is in the courtroom arguing, begging the jury to do more. I'm not saying this, this person's a great person. Pearson person is a great person. But... How do you balance Lady Justice here? Why is it so personal to this prosecutor? And why, when police are spat on, does it require 70 years? But when you maybe look a different way, you're a victim of something horrific. Sometimes nothing happens and there's not even an indictment. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, this case really condenses a lot of different things into one because the original arrest 
was for domestic assault, right? That's what the original arrest was for. Um, and then, of course, there's the layer of this is a black man spitting on a police officer. OK, so we have several different layers here. First and foremost, they wanted to prove a point. They wanted they really wanted to get this guy for what? For spitting on police officers. They didn't really want to get this guy for like allegedly committing domestic assault. That was like and apparently had like previous charges for domestic assault. So what is being valued here by the system more? Whose lives are worth what? Right. Because. We have three different instances here where you have like the police officers just dignity when it comes to them being spat on. You have a black man whose life is being, you know, literally stripped away by being put into jail for 70 years. And then, of course, you have whoever the victim potentially was of uh, of uh, the alleged domestic violence. Right. And so this one instance really, I think, encapsulates all that, that rather than focus on uh, all of these actual victims and the, the real problems that exist in our society spitting on a police officer apparently is the number one crime in America that really needs to be dealt with, I guess. Well, you know, I mean, prosecutors and police, they have drinks together and they hang out and they work so closely together. So yeah, that trumped everything apparently. Okay. Trumped everything. Wow. We'll, we'll keep following Mr. Pearson's plight, the sentence, and we'll see what ultimately comes of it. Married Nine one one operator is caught in a cop sex scandal, and damn it, this gets deep. Let's put the picture up full mass. The hell is going on in these police departments? Uh, Crystal Perez, Merritt, Texas nine one one dispatcher at San Antonio's Baxter County Sheriff's Department faces termination after she was allegedly caught sexting seven. She was sexting seven cops having affairs with at least two others. Ms. Perez has been placed on leave over the sleazy messages, which saw her speak with both sergeant and deputy at length about alleged past tryst. Other messages sent by Perez, 38, and covered by her husband, Mr. Perez, 41, contain equally sexed up correspondence between her and four other officers employed by the force, as well as a cop at a nearby department. That's unfair for her to be the face of this story. Let's put up the other faces in this story. You got Deputy Juan Leal has been placed on unpaid leave. And Deputy Jason Jarvis has been hit with a 30-day suspension. Damn, they would have been better off as far as penalty if they shot an unarmed citizen. Now, I'm going to explain in just a moment why this is problematic for everybody. Let's go to Sergeant Ronaldo Solanis, who has been placed on leave without pay also. All right. Salinas, Lil, Perez have all been warned by the county sheriff's office that they are likely to lose their jobs. They denied misbehaving while on duty. But the sheriff is now investigating to see whether this is true. <clears throat> Messages sent to Salinas suggests he and Ms. Perez met up for sex while Jarvis's wife, who's now divorcing him, said he admitted an affair to her. We got the screenshots, put them up. Text messages, that's called receipts, okay? Those are receipts. Uh, let's put up the husband, Ms. Mr. Perez. All right. He said, and I quote, keep his picture up. She was the love of my life. And it was very distraught, heartbreaking. 41 year old uh, Jim Carlo told KABB San Antonio over the weekend of how his marriage imploded last December when he discovered the text on his wife's phone. I was in disbelief, he says in the clip. And at one point even appeared on the verge of wretching as he recalled the traumatic discovery. Listen, man, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine, okay? Um, he knew some of these folks. I can't imagine. Uh, but let's be very clear why this is important for the public and for the community, period. Let's say something happens. Let's say you have to hold an officer accountable because they misstep, they committed a criminal violation. They 
violated the civil rights of another human being. Let's say that happened, right? If that happened, who do you think And everybody's compromised when people should be held accountable. And a decision has to be made. Am I going to hold the person that I'm already committing this act with accountable or shut up, lie on the report, let it pass so it doesn't blow back on me? That is the problem. That is the public dynamic that has to be checked. These inappropriate relationships lead to a bad outcome for citizens who require transparency for the system of law enforcement to operate for them. Sharon, thoughts on this? I thought I worked at some wild places. <laughs> I just don't even, what is going on with these people and these places and these full frontal, well, confessions? I don't know that I would want to digest this publicly. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, you know, what else can you say? Let's stay with um, jail, okay? This is in Atlanta, Fulton County Jail, right? A lot of inmates, overcrowding has been a problem in the past. An inmate though, eaten alive, eaten alive by bed bugs is a whole nother matter. And that is exactly what's being alleged here. Let's tell you more about it here in Georgia. LaShawn Thompson, 35, just 35 years old, died in September while in custody at Fulton County Jail, perishing after just a three month stay. His family says he was eaten alive by bed bugs and insects. They're now demanding accountability in the death of their loved one. Family's lawyer is calling for a criminal investigation and a new Fulton County Jail to be built. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to build anymore? These are photos provided by the family's lawyer and they show a jail cell in deplorable conditions. Pictures, Thompson's body of his face and torso covered with bugs. Family's attorney, Michael Harper says, Thompson was diagnosed with schizophrenia, but was physically healthy when booked into jail. There's no excuse for a mentally ill inmate to be left alone in a jail, abandoned to die, he continues. They did nothing to help him, nothing. They found him dead in his cell, lying there, infested with bed bugs and lice. And that is what killed him. It's just gut-wrenching. It's disgusting. According to WSB-TV, the photos of Thompson's face and body covered with insects are too graphic to show on television. A spokesperson for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, which runs the jail, says this in a written statement. First and foremost, Fulton County Sheriff's Office would like to extend condolences to the family of LaShawn Thompson. The manner and cause of death was listed as undetermined by the county medical examiner. Full investigation was launched into the circumstances surrounding Mr. Thompson's death. Part of that ongoing investigation, immediate action was taken, including but not limited to approving an additional expenditure of $500,000 to address the infestation of bed bugs, lice, and other vermin within the Fulton County Jail, which was done in addition to prior cleaning operations targeting communicable diseases that are common in congregate settings. Updating protocols for security rounds to include addressing sanitary conditions. That from the Fulton County Sheriff's Office by way of Channel 2 News in Atlanta. Statement continues to say the ongoing investigation is examining details regarding the medical care provided and ultimately will determine whether any criminal charges are warranted in this case, the health, well-being, and security of inmates in our care, here's that middle finger part, folks, is our top priority. It's no secret that the dilapidated, rapidly eroding conditions of the current facility make it incredibly difficult to meet the goal of providing a clean, well-maintained, and healthy environment for all inmates and staff. That is precisely why Sheriff Labatt continues to call for building a new Fulton County Jail and criminal justice complex, which will provide an elite level of care, mental health services, security, and cleanliness. I could barely get through the statement. This man, according to family, family attorney, eaten alive. Can you imagine a more horrific way to die? Left for dead, 
not give an intervention. And oh, yeah, you do two things that I call middle finger. You say your top priority is these inmates. OK, and then you make a pitch for tax dollars to get a brand new jail built at the end. Who are these people? Have they no shame, Benny? Yeah, it's completely shameless. And it's so infuriating because like what a lot of people don't realize is American prisons. Not only do we have like the most people in prison compared to any other country, but also we fundamentally uh, have some of the worst conditions within prisons. And this is torture. There's no other way to to put it other than to say that this fundamentally is torture. Um because it takes an extreme amount of neglect. I've never heard of anybody dying of bed bugs literally ever before in my entire life. Uh, so it must take like a very extreme amount of neglect. And on top of that, it's just the entire dehumanizing nature. Because like, and that's what's really important to understand here is that our prisons and our jails in the United States were fundamentally built on the premise of dehumanizing anybody that's within those systems. Because quite literally, um, Prison, in effect, was a reform for slavery, right? Mm -hmm. That literally our prison system as it exists today was intentionally created by white supremacists when slavery ended as a way to just recreate slavery. Well, OK, we'll just jail people for no reason um, and then we'll rent them back to the plantation owners. And that literally was like the originating model for the prison system within the United States. And there's been reforms since then and some changes since then. But ultimately, the underlying philosophical belief of the prison system is to dehumanize the people who are incarcerated in one way, shape or form. And like fundamentally, that is wrong. It is disgusting and it is horrific. The conditions that exist within our prisons. I mean, fundamentally, American prisons do not basic do not meet basic international standards for human rights. And that is already a low, low bar. That is already a low, low bar. And it is just sickening and disgusting to see this. And then once again, you see the same problem all over again, where Anytime there's a problem, instead of like addressing the problem directly, right, whether this is with the policing system or the prison system, they create these problems through willful neglect. And then they say, oh, don't worry, we'll fix it if you give us more money. Give us more money so that we can have a better tank. And then our response to protesters will be better next time. And then our response to whatever will be better next time, right? They don't solve crimes and they say, oh, you just give us more police officers, we'll start solving the crime. And they never do. Right. It's just this ridiculous scheme because fundamentally, right, from the the from the police officing system all the way through the legal system, all the way to the prison system it is a system that is designed to dehumanize anybody that is of any marginalized community, all ultimately to the benefit of the contractors that build the prisons. Right. Uh, sometimes private companies that rent out uh, people to work for them uh, and uh, really just the larger interest of capitalism more broadly. Wow, that's a period. You understand? That's a period right there. But a postscript would be, what's the crime here? Schizophrenia? You don't need another jail. You need to learn how to deal with people and treat them like people. Disgusting. Keep following that one. One more for your Arizona court. Rules the Mormon church can conceal crimes. That's the ruling. Arizona court ruling made April 7th allows the Church of Latter-day Saints to hide child abuse from the public as long as it's disclosed in a spiritual confession. Wow. That ruling allows Mormon church officials to refuse, refuse to turn over documentation or answer any questions regarding the crime. Although the state Supreme Court made its decision earlier this month, the ruling was not made public until Tuesday, April 12. Where's the transparency? The ruling was made after a lawsuit began following a 2010 child abuse case against a man named Paul Douglas Adams right there. Adams told the Latter-day Saints Bishop in 2011 that he was abusing his five-year-old daughter. Stories said the bishop did not report the abuse to authorities and that Adams continued to abuse the girl for seven more years then began to sexually abuse her newborn sister. And then the bishop asked Adams to report the abuse to police, but Adams refused and declined to give Herod permission to make the report himself after his confidential confession 
According to the church's statement, Herod also asked Adam's wife, Laiza, to report. She refused and later served a prison sentence for failure to report sexual abuse. Adams was caught after continued abuse without any intervention from the church. Adams died by suicide in jail after he was arrested for child pornography for filming and distributing sexual acts with the girls. Now Arizona judges have made their decision. Lawyers representing Adams' children took the case to the Arizona Supreme Court, which ended up siding with the church. The attorneys attend to file a motion asking the court to reconsider its ruling. Wow. This has not been the first case of the church turning a blind eye to cases of child abuse and will not be the last under current legislation. Here are Herman Law statistics regarding child abuse by clergy members. And there you see it. The stats show child abuse allegations were made against 4,392 priests, totaling 4% of all Catholic priests. 22% of victims were 10 or under. 80% of victims were male. Only 2% of the accused priest went to prison. You got all these prisons, but you don't want to put the child abusers in them. You go first, Benny. Yeah, I mean, like, did I hear that number right? 4%? Was it, yes. it was 4% of priests? That's like one out of every 20, right? Like, and like the fact that like, you know, the church didn't have to like bring in a lawsuit to say like, hey, I want to be very clear. We don't have to report this. Right. Like, I mean, this is what's so disgusting, especially like and, and it's hard not to like listen to this as a trans person where people are actively trying to pretend like trans people are some sort of threat to children. When you literally have an entire institution that is out stats. trying to protect themselves from like just reporting, just reporting right known instances of not just like physical abuse but literal sexual abuse of children like are you kidding me this is so disgusting like fundamentally if there's something deeply deeply wrong with our society and like honestly like look if your religion is asking you to cover up if your religion is asking you to cover up the sexual abuse of a literal child what are you doing Literally, what are you doing? Like, re there are plenty of Christians out there that don't actually feel the need to cover up child sexual abuse. Believe it or not. I know this is such a wild concept. And so it's just fundamentally disgusting, not only that there's large religious institutions that are willing to do these cover-ups, but it is even more disgusting that our legal system gives legitimacy to those people in some of the same states in some of the same exact states where they're trying to criminalize the existence of transgender people just for existing, right? And just everything about this story is absolutely infuriating and disgusting. And it speaks to the extreme shamelessness of the Republican Party. And honestly, like, why are more Democrats not actively pushing against this? I get it. Well, you might offend some percent of like religious people, but why? I do care about offending those people. I personally don't care about offending people if they think it's so important that people cover up child sexual assault. Like, I, I don't care about offending them. Some things are just black and white, okay? There's just, it is either you're abusing children and covering it up, or you believe that they should be cherished and protected. Which is it? Because once I get my answer, if it looks anything like the story we just reported, not my church. I don't even know if you should be classified. What is the definition of religion and what's it there for? It's sick. You're right. Disgusting, Benny. Uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Indisputable. I am Sharon Reed and for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. We've had an eventful show. Still more to come. Uh, but I do want to give some of your comments. TYT members first about that Texas black man who spat on officers, love it, Texas, got 70 years reportedly for it. Cats and Dragon says, yet the governor is trying to pardon someone convicted of obvious murder, referring to the BLM uh, activist who was murdered. Inmate eaten alive by bed bugs in a Fulton County jail. Okay, yeah, this is a real story, folks, real, real story. An actual talking cat says, that county jail is like something from the dark ages, absolute savages. Now remember, the sheriff's putting out a statement saying, well, if you just give me more money for a new jail, we won't have inmates eaten alive by bed bugs and lice. 
He said, it won't happen. That's what he said. YouTube members, Northside Yanks, about the black man who spat on officers. Spitting on someone doesn't even warrant one year in jail, let alone 70. It warrants something because it is pretty gross. But you're right. 70 years. What are we doing here? What are we doing? I want one more. The Arizona court ruling that the Mormon church can conceal crimes. Lori Park says, remember, these are so-called Christians. Right to life, Christians. Break every 10 commandments in that Bible. That is your take, Lori. And now you've been heard. And now, welcome to the bullpen. Yes, there's some very suspicious people and they're going to rob and steal and kill people. We're at 4053 <laughs> Gold Rapids Avenue. Please come in a hurry. And there it is. Can an actor, writer, producer extraordinaire just ride a bike? Just ride a bike in Studio City, California without being attacked by a vicious Karen? Apparently not. Amir Mo joins us now. Welcome to the bullpen. Um, we're just honored to have you on and to really update this encounter. Really a scary encounter because <laughs> you never know what these Karens are going to do. Uh, but welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to talk about, you know, your your indie comedy feature too, but let's start with that day in Studio City and remind us you were riding a bike, but you were out kind of scouting and doing things as well for, for this extraordinary work that you do. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sharon. Um, yeah, I had a screen test. They, the casting directors wanted to see me on a bike, so you know, I just got myself a new bike. Literally, as I look to my left, I see exactly where that video was taking place, uh, less than 100 feet away from my uh, my building. And um, I'm just trying to get some footage of me on my bike. And uh, as I was pulling in to this area, I, you know, comedically said, well, I think I got a, sh a, a Karen behind me. Um, because she was, she was really like slow. I gave her all the room to get in. Wait, you, know, you really to, said that up here? I, I really did say that. I really actually did say that. I'm not, I'm not even Just joking sense. because she had so much room to, to drive past me to go where she was going and she was just kind of hanging back. And I was like, <laughs> maybe I had a Karen behind me. And then she pulled over and made this big ruckus and, you know, called, called the police and said that I looked like I wanted to, to kill and rob, um, which, you know, we know, we know the history. Sure. You know, yeah. What first, I understand that your, your Karen radar went up. The instinct was there that you said, okay, we, we might have a problem here. Okay. With another wild one, here we go. But when you began to unpack it and realize, no, oh, you're really calling the police on me here. Did you want to, and I don't know if anger is the first thing you felt, but is there this need to rationalize and say, come on? Yeah, I mean, I grew up with really overt, over the top, you know, blatant racism. And it, and it wasn't just like kids around my block. Wow. Like it was it was adults in like the school system. So for me, um, I've kind of been desensitized towards that stuff um, for better or for worse. So, um, yeah, I mean. I think anytime police get involved, you really don't know how it's going to go. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's playing with fire. So it's, it's a, it's a gamble, you know, like obviously you would think that, the, that, you know, she'd be kind of laughed off the phone maybe, uh, you know, like he's, he's riding a bike. Um, what's, what's the issue? Um, but you never know. What was it that made you tell your girlfriend Robin, right? Um, 
hey, you, let's document this. You got to document this. Um, was there that additional fear? You mentioned the police, but to say, hey, look, I did nothing here. Yeah, I mean, part, part of it was that. And, and also part of it is we, we need to call this stuff out. Like we, it's been going on for way too long and there have been deadly consequences in the past. And I think it's a good thing that, you know, you guys are highlighting this type of stuff and, and we're, we're more privy to this type of behavior that happens all around us. And, you know, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any consequences for that woman. Um, and there absolutely should be like, you know, there, there's laws on the books, you know, about that stuff. So um, I was just like, keep it rolling. Re like obviously mm -hmm. record because um, it's it's my word versus hers. And she's the lighter one. So, <laughs> so there it is. Uh, that part. Yeah. 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 So you never know which way it's going to go. The response from the police, uh, you know, they directed Indisputable to go, you know, go get the police report. But you're right. It does seem like it's like, you know, nothing to see here. It's a low level thing. Maybe two people, both sides, you know, whatever they do. And to me, I couldn't agree with you more. You have to call it out every single time. And I think public shaming is part of the process, if only there was shame involved. I think these Karens and this way of thinking, they're the root of almost everything. And that's the real danger here. How can we get people who aren't black, brown to pay more attention and say, you know, knock it off? I think when it starts happening in their own communities and when it starts happening to their own, they start paying attention. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated issue and it's easy to sweep it under the rug by saying, you know, she, she's an old woman and, you know, she doesn't know any better, this type of stuff. But um, yeah, well, I mean, we just got to continue to highlight it and, and, and beat that drum. And I think hold, hold the police to the fire and be like, this law's on the books on this stuff. Like you guys, you guys Good arrest job. people for a lot, for a lot less. So yeah. There's something that you said, and uh, I get it, you know, as a brown girl, but it also kind of breaks my heart because, you know, you were a kid. I was a kid at one point, and I think my parents and I suspect yours taught us that we're just going to have to navigate this and achieve regardless. You're going to have to find your way and achieve. But you said you were so used to it from adults that you perhaps are desensitized. It breaks my heart now for our kids do you know what i mean and i wonder if you've unpacked that more yeah i mean i, I unpack it in in very weird ways which is like through comedy um and so um you know a, a lot of people who, who read my work or, or see my work they, some you know it's not necessarily for everyone and they don't necessarily get it but it's it's kind of my own way of of dealing with some of the you know atrocities that I went through as a kid. Yeah. Well, you've been hugely successful though on, on a number of these NBC Universal programs as an actor, as we mentioned, writer, producer. But tell us about about your latest work and what we can expect. Sure. Yeah. I got I got a, a feature film in post production. It's called Relation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously a comedy, um, and um, I don't have a release date on it yet. It's TBD, but uh, we're getting close. And if you guys want to see my my past work, uh, the Sex Addict is free on Tubi right now, and that features <laughs> Horatio Sands from Saturday Night Live and Brian Callen from Mad TV and uh, Ken Davidian from Borat. You said your work isn't for everyone, but I wonder when you sit down and you decide to do a project or you decide to write, produce a project, are you thinking about, you know, and it's an indie, your, your latest, but are you thinking about casting a net to both people who, you, you know, would, would want to and be included in those who would consume, you know, an Amir Mo project, but also those who might, you know, kind of just be peeking around and discover something and learn something about someone who's maybe not like themselves or go outside of their comfort zone? Yeah, I mean, I typically like to take like broad topics like that's kind of the um, that's kind of the the sugary stuff. And then in inside that, I like to inject the vegetables. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I entice you with, with, with the, you know, the, the glitzy stuff and then I give you something you didn't know you needed.
How is that received when you go in? Because I'm so curious about this. I've done a little bit of acting, um, but well, it's funny that I always play the same character, you know, <laughs> Channel 4 News. Uh, but that's okay. At some point, they'll let me play a lawyer or something to judge. Yeah, I can see you on SVU. It. Okay, this is what it get me on there. But I want to know from you how it's received when you go in and you say, I want to do this. Do they push back? Do you push harder? Do you alter it? Like, how does that work? You have a body of work that is successful, so maybe you have more leeway now. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, You know, oftentimes we highlight blatant racism um, or or blatant biases. And this is an industry where it's got plenty of that, but it's, (laughs) it's, it's, it's less overt. So they say that they want diversity on screen, but they don't necessarily want diversity of story. Mm-hmm. So they're like, yeah, yeah, like you're, you look, you look the, the part, but oh, this is the kind of story you want to tell. Not so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like it's gotten, and I, this is like, I hate those same old questions, but I have to ask it because you've been doing it long enough. Do you feel like it's getting better, the diversity of thought? and the diversity of, you know, behind, in front of, all the way around, the executives. Is there enough diversity in everything that you can honestly say things have gotten better? I would say things have gotten better, um, at least like incrementally. And I don't know that it's, again, like you say you want diversity, but none of your execs are particularly diverse. So you're not getting the stories that, First, people want to talk about a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it, it is getting better, um, not fast enough for, for my liking, but it does seem to be getting a little bit better. And um, I think at the end of the day, like you got to you got to go where your passion, you know, is pulling you to go. And, and you know, if you do it successfully, then I think people will eventually follow. Is that the advice you would give, um, you know, the next Amir Mo, not to suggest that, you know, there's will ever be another, but a young person who says, you know what, I want to do this. And now there's all this streaming and there's so many different avenues that I can get it done. Is that the suggestion that you would give them? Just follow your passion and don't try to fit in a mold. Cause I feel like everything's secular, right? Where, oh, now it's all these judge shows. Now it's this law and crime and whatever. Should you try to follow the trend or should you just go your own way? I think I really think that, like, first of all, I would say don't do this type of work unless you absolutely have to, unless you're obsessed with it. Um, because I see people be like, oh, I'll give it a try for a year. or I'll do this. And I was like, yeah, this is like you've got to be ingrained in this. But um, I really like for me, it's it's hard for me to do my best when I'm not passionate about the work. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll get auditions for certain roles and I'll be like, that wasn't it. And it's because I'm not passionate about the role or the story or anything like that. So I think, you know, for me particularly, I have to do something that I'm like really passionate and I, and I can get like obsessed about. So. Well, we're almost out of time. I do have one more question for you because now that we've even updated the story, I'm wondering, you're so creative, you know, and everything that you write and produce and, you know, star and even will this Karen from studio city become an inspiration for you in some way in your work? Yes. That's a good question. Um, Or is she not worthy? Maybe she's not worthy. So even before her, I actually, um, I'm actually shopping a a, a Christmas script right now. It's not your, it's not your typical Hallmark script at all. It's, it's, it's about like meeting your, you know, partner's parents for the first time and their Karens. Oh God. They're like MAGA Karens. (laughs) I know so, a story about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, in a way, she's already she's already in. Right. She, but to be clear, I just want to make it clear, wherever you are, Karen, in Studio City, you get no credit. Don't come after the man for any money. You're not. Yeah. It's a collective collection of Karens that have put this thing together. Well, we just love you. I appreciate you taking the time out. Sorry that this happened to you. And I think you're right. Again, we have to call it out. We have to shine a light on it. Because it's not right, Amir Mo. Thank you so much. And I look forward to whatever you got coming up next. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. You got it. Thanks. And thank you for joining us. Um, Gosh, great, great, great talent. And um, happy to update it. And wherever you are, Karen.
karma. I suspect it's coming. Thanks for watching.